coming up, an interview with a mystery singer who had two songs in the top 10 at the very same time with two different bands. Here's the thing, he never got credit. Nobody knew who he was until much later. One of these songs was so massive, it became the number one song of that year, beating out the Stones and Elvis, even the Beatles. They all had big hits that year. But this song, it's so catchy, everyone was singing it then, and we're still singing it now. And I think this number one smash was written with preschoolers in mind, for a cartoon even. There was so much mystery surrounding the identity of the singer and his imaginary band, it was actually a trivia question that no one could solve for years. The trivia question was, what group never appeared together, never went on the road together, never interviewed together, and had a number one hit? Coming up, we're gonna get the answer. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the hilarious exploits of BC, the Family Circus in Bloom County and the Daily Comics page, growing up, you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia, really nostalgia overall. Make sure to subscribe right now, uh, hit the big red button to get the story straight from the legends, click the bell so you always know when our stuff's coming out. Also take a look at our Patreon, we're releasing full interviews there. So I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations. This is where featured artists go deep on their greatest songs and their greatest albums, stories and insight you won't get anywhere else. So today we're gonna sit down with a mystery singer who had two hits in the top 10 at the very same time with two different bands, but he never got credit for it. One of those songs went to number one for four weeks in the US and a phenomenal eight weeks in the UK, outperforming huge hits from the same year like Honky Tonk Woman by the Rolling Stones. Suspicious Minds by Elvis. And Come Together by the Beatles. Come together. This song would also inspire another massive hit decades later, Pour Some Sugar On Me by Def Leppard. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm talking about the infectious pop ditty, Sugar Sugar by the cartoon group, The Archies. It's actually sung by today's guest, Ron Dante. Ron was also the lead singer of the band The Cufflings, who had a top 10 hit at the very same time that Sugar Sugar was dominating the charts. It was called Tracy. Tracy I'm gonna be happy with you. He sang both of these hits, and nobody knew who the hell he was. He was uncredited uh, for a long time. Find out why, and the story of the number one song of 1969. <laughs> Such a cool story coming up on our interview. As we go into the sit down, I do wanna thank our sponsor, Zenni Eyewear, the brand of glasses I always wear. You know, Zenni is amazing because you can design your own pair of glasses, what looks great on you, uh, what you like, and you can do a virtual try-on at their website before you purchase to see how you look. You can add other amazing features, and you can do all this for up to 80% off regular retail prices. Just click on our link below, our info button right up here, and you can get the best deal here is Ron Dante. Don Kirshner was the man behind the monkeys. He put them together and uh, gave them five or six major hits. Monstrously big, but they, they had a problem. They wanted to create their own music. I understand, they, they were singers, they were songwriters. Uh, so they, they pulled away from Don Kirshner and got him fired from Screen Gems Columbia Music. I mean, it was a terrible time for him, but he came back, he opened up his own company, and he started to do, uh, Kansas was one of his groups. So he, uh, he decided to become music director of a TV series, the Archie's cartoon series, based on the comic book. Come on, let's go with the Archie show. I got a call that they were doing sessions with him. And a friend of mine was playing the keyboards on it. And uh, Ron Frangipani is his name. And uh, Ron said, you know, they're looking for a lead singer. So I, call, I had known Don from b publishing days earlier right. in my career. I called him up, I said, uh, can I come over? He said, sure, come over. I went over to the studio, RCA studio, and, he, uh, and the writer-producer was there, Jeff Barry. And Jeff, of course, was one of the oh. architects of pop music. He wrote maybe 30. Baby. Hanky Panky, yep. Do Do Run Run, Then He Kissed Me. You, you name it, Jeff and his wife, Ellie, at the time, yeah. wrote 30 or 40 big hits. Oh, yeah. So I knew I was in great hands. And uh, they played me a song, it was called Bang Shang-A-Lang. 
And Bang Shangri La was kind of a cute novelty thing. And I, I sang with my, my hushed sound and I doubled my voice. And they said, You've got to, you, we want you to be the voice of Archie. My heart went bang, shang, lang, bang, shang, lang. Wow. So that, that began it. And uh, I knew it had a good shot because it was on TV. Don Kirshner was like P.T. Barnum. He could promote anything. You know, he, he knew how to get it out to the public. He rented Madison Square Garden for the debut of this first Archie's album. And, we, and I played, along with the local DJs, there were like 10 of us, uh, against the Globetrotters, the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> we're, there was a celebrity basketball. I was the center. So he, he promoted like crazy. The TV show was a number one hit. And the first single did pretty well. Bang Shang Lang made the charts. Bang, shang, bang. Right, it was yeah. doing very well. But the, you know, some of the DJs thought, this is a cartoon group, it's kind of make-believe. Maybe we won't play the next single. So uh, then th we got around to uh, Sugar Sugar, and uh, they were have we were having trouble getting it played. So one of the promotion men in San Francisco took the label off yeah. and, and, and gave it to a, a DJ and said, just play it a couple of times. And they played it on the big, uh, big KFI, whatever it is up in San Francisco. And uh, it, the phones lit up. And, and it spread across the world. That, the little record that could. Here we go with our new hit record, Sugar, Sugar! Well, it's an irresistible song. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what age you are, you're yeah. just like, I love that song. Andy Kim, of course, wrote it with Jeff Berry. Number one pop for four weeks. Biggest song of 1969. It was huge worldwide, though. Like, it went yeah. number one in the UK for double that amount of time, eight yes. weeks. They were sick of it by the time, it, <laughs> the, after eight weeks. It was the sixth biggest hit of the 60s as well. Wow. And six times platinum. Number 78 of all time. I just read that. Wow. From 1955 to 2015, I bet. it was number 78 top 100 songs of all time. Which Canada, was, yeah. Belgium, Austria, Germany, Ireland, Norway, Spain. Number one in all of those. I mean, it's just, just how massive this song was. I just can't believe the loveliness of loving you. Also, it was initially released on calendar, and then it was, when it was having trouble, Kirshner released it on his uh, Kirshner record. There was always a rumor, and I think it's been proved to be false, that uh, they wanted the monkeys to sing Sugar Sugar. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that uh, Jeff Berry said, no, that, that is not correct. That never happened. Because uh, anyway, but I just yeah. want to bring up that rumor because it's a good that's rumor. when you know, yeah, it's a, that's it's when a you good know that a song has really connected with people and people start making up urban legends about it. You know, I don't really know the true story. Mickey Dolenz is a friend of mine and so is Davy Jones. And he and covered it later on. He covered it finally after 30 years, he finally yeah. cut it. But he said to me, he turned it down. So I don't know the actual truth of it, but it, it's a great story. Like the summer sunshine they may have been offered a song with sugar in the title that might have happened yeah. to them also in their minds it goes it's so long ago there are a lot of songs with sugar in the title in the 60s sugar shack and definitely so on, so yeah also the only time in billboard history and still the only time that a fictional group had the number one song of the year unbelievable um, and the song is so perfect how it starts with the jangle guitar jing -in jing -in. I always thought it was a xylophone. The da -na -na -na. Is that a ba -ba 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 -ba. That's yeah. a tack, that's a piano, a Fender Rhodes, and a marimba. Oh, honey, honey. On the marimba, more uh, tropical. And it was that combination of sound that just worked that day. People were trying to get that sound when they recut it, but it was just, it just happened. One, you know, it happened in the studio that day. And my friend Ron Frangipani came up kind of with that, that figure. Yeah. And, uh, it's funny how that, uh, that sound is, is, is kind of infectious. You know, Andy told me that he had broken his pick while he was trying to put the, lay down the track, so he used a matchbook to play the guitar. So there's that flapping on the acoustic guitar that gives it its extra sound. Honey. I don't know if that's true, but it sure sounds it. Yeah. Because they caught something that day. I've always believed that you can catch lightning in a bottle sometimes if you work hard enough and you get lucky enough. But you gotta keep recording, you gotta keep making stuff. 
I mean, I had been making singles until Sugar Sugar hit. And Bang Shang, I had been making singles for five years already, and none of them had been any hits. But you, you got to hang you in there. You learned your craft, though. I learned because it. Because you were so great at multi-tracking your voice. I mean, yeah. you're a lot of the voices and the harmonies mm -hmm. on that record, Sugar Sugar. Multi-tracking vocals, you really became a master for that. And I think, I'm sure it was because of that experience. It was. And also, uh, uh, there was a guy named Les Paul. Uh, oh, who, yeah who uh, developed guitars, of course, but he had Les Paul and Mary Ford was a, a record he made out. Mm -hmm. And his wife, I think, was Mary Ford. And on the record, she multi-tracks. And I remember as a kid thinking, what is that sound? It's all her. Three or four harmonies, all her. So when I started to get in the studio, of course, multi-tracking became very popular because you could. Mm -hmm. Even though we only, we worked with four tracks. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so we put the whole, all the music on one track and then we keep bouncing things back and forth. So by the time it bounced back and forth, you put the needle on it and went shh, because it hiss builds up yeah. as you keep going bouncing back and forth. <laughs> but it's, I didn't care. I love being able to harmonize with myself or double track my voice, which uh, it's a sound in and of itself when you multi-track. I notice a few artists do it uh, occasionally uh, and it still works. Now they do it electronically, but I'm, I'm a big fan of not electronically. I'm a big fan of doing it organically. You know, let, let, sing with yourself, get the phrasing together, get the tuning together. Sometimes, because it's not perfect, it sounds great. Was it hard being anonymous? Because here you have the biggest song of the year, everybody's playing it. It, it wasn't difficult at all. I was, by then I was a pro. Yeah. I was doing jingle sessions, singing commercials every day. Uh, I was doing backgrounds for other people. Uh, I was used to being anonymous, but it was my business. It was my craft. I just wanted to sing. And I, I just loved singing. Yeah. I enjoyed it. And it was after every session, I'd listen back and I'd say, Dad, this is, I had a lot of fun doing this. I actually got paid to do this. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I loved it. So it was fine. I, I, I knew that eventually my name would get out there in yeah. some form and it would help the career. I wasn't anxious. I, I understood that it's a process. And sometimes you have to take a back seat to somebody else to get yeah. ahead. Well, and Jeff Berry and, uh, of course, Andy Kim. But what great writers, the way that they structured that song, because, you know, the sugar, sugar and honey, honey, and then switching them, honey, honey, sugar, sugar. It's, it just is so infectious, you know? Everybody sings it. Sugar. Oh, honey, honey. You've probably seen that thing where, where kids listen to music, kids listen to, and they show kids like, music from yeah. today or from yeah. the 80s and get their reaction yeah. uh, or yesteryear. And every time uh, with Sugar Sugar, they're like, oh, I love this song. Oh, I know this song. You know? I'm so proud of that. <laughs> I noticed that we played on Disney radio sometimes. Uh, there are new versions. In England, one of the soccer teams the lead in Liverpool, the, the, the lead player, was coming out of the locker room singing, honey, honey, <laughs> honey. And the entire audience started to sing yeah. for good luck and they won. <laughs> yeah. So now they sing sugar, sugar and hunt, bop, bop. They, go, they all go bop, 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 bop. 50,000 crazed soccer fans. My name is Kevin Murphy and I love Liverpool. Some it has a life go, of its own. It really does. And it was inducted in the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. I oh. saw that. And then uh, the high notes at the end, too. I love your high notes at the end where you're like, uh, pour a little sugar. Pour you know? a little sugar on me, honey. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's what, what's so great is it, it, sugar, sugar, and honey, honey, and then switching them, and then the vocals as it builds, and Again, in, in a three-minute pop song, it's like the perfect, it really is the perfect pop song. It, led, it led the way. For, for You have to realize we were making this for preteens yes. and for kids that were watching animators. We, we didn't want to compete with The Who, The Beatles, the early, any of these great groups that were out there. It was not, it just, but it overtook it. In countries where they didn't see the cartoons, they just liked the sound. And friend, friend of mine has over 50, maybe 60 singles 
from all around the world in different languages. Yeah, you know, I mean, you can to play different five countries. seconds of a song, two seconds, and you know what it is. That's right, it know? had that, that uh, the intros, I was a big fan of intros. Great covers, too. I mean, Wilson Pickett had a hit with it less than a year later when yeah, he covered it. That's right. Went to number 25 on the pop charts and number four on the R&B charts. Unbelievable. You are my candy girl. And then Tommy Rowe. Oh, honey, honey. Alex Chilton. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Bob Marley covered it. Really? You know? yeah. I love that. Who else? Uh, uh, Tina Turner has a version. And then, of course, in 1981, it recharted in a way because it was part of Stars on 45. Yeah, something about that rhythm, about that uh, the, yeah. the, the hook. Never overlook, giving it a hook. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> been used so much in pop culture. The Simpsons, two different episodes, but when your song's been sung by Homer Simpson, 30 years after it was a huge hit, Sugar, do 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 do. Oh, honey, honey, do do. Riverdale, of course, because Archie's back in the. Archie's back. Yeah. Riverdale's a big hit. Josie and the Pussycats mm -hmm. covered it there. A B movie, Seinfeld, and Family Guy. Now and then. If we sat here and listed all the movies and TV shows that have used it, we'd be here for a long time. So I'm and it, <laughs> it seems like they like it. it. It evokes a certain feeling in people. It does. It does. It gets the it's, people. It's, get, it gets them up feel a good, bit. Yeah. Feel good song. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize this. I'm a chart geek, so I, I love the charts. Ever since I was a little kid, I love growing these records out. That baseball is probably why baseball and music are my two favorite things because there's always a stat you can throw out, right? Yes. That that uh, this is the first time this ever happened and so on and so forth. But Cardi B, she had two songs in the top 10 mm. and the Beatles and Ashanti are, are, are the only uh, artists to have done that before. They're actually wrong because John Mellencamp has done it, but you did it. I did it. Yes. You did it <laughs> because you sang on Tracy. Yes. Tracy never You were the lead singer of the Cufflinks, right. and Tracy was making it up. It, it actually went into the top 10. Two, two weeks it did that. The Archies, when Sugar Sugar was coming down, they were in the top 10. So yep. you've done that. I was, I was very proud. I would listen to uh, ABC in New York City, Cousin Brucey and all the good guys. Yeah. And it, within an hour, they would play both Sugar Sugar and Tracy <laughs> and one of my commercials. <laughs> What wisdom would you impart to the coming generation, either getting into the music industry or anything creative, really? What have you learned? Because you've had your shares of ups and downs. I mean, you've oh, yeah. had a lot of successes, but you've also had oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> things that, that you've learned from. I'm, I'm not one to give advice because yeah. everybody has their own path. Sure. But if you've got a talent, nurture it, use it, network it. <laughs> Change things if it's not working. You've got to learn to say, this is not working. I've got to change. Change is the most important thing you can do with your career as your life. Change is the hardest thing. And, and keep upping your game. And, and be realistic with yourself, but don't be too harsh on yourself. Anything can happen. Go big Anything. or go Anything. Look at the successes that are out there. People have dreamed of it in their, in their bedrooms, in front of a mirror or in an idea they had. You know, I, that's, that, that would be my sole advice. Well, last question, Ron, um, looking back on your life, your, your personal life, your career up to this point, what are you most grateful for? Oh, I'm grateful for music. I'm grateful for being able to sing. I'm grateful for the really nice people around me that I put, I put together a team of people that I love and love me and support me. And I support them. You have to give to get. Yeah. So that's what I'm most grateful for. I'm grateful for getting the opportunities that came along and knowing that they were. And, and jumping at them, you know. Sometimes you, you, you hesitate. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for my health and I'm grateful for still being here and active. This is just one of those songs that when you hear it, you're singing it. It's <laughs> uh, Sugar Sugar Man. 
Leave us a comment about this. What are your memories of, what are your thoughts on this song and this imaginary band, the Archies and the Journeyman singer, Ron Dante. Uh, great producer as well, produced many of uh, Barry Manilow's biggest albums. Just a prolific career there. What do you think of his other work? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We would love to have you as part of our community about keeping the music alive. That's what it's all about. Till next time, Records and the truth.